kids. It's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? That's a loaded question. It's always a loaded question. It's, it's Yeah, it's a little more <laughs> loaded than usual. <laughs> and why is that? Because uh, my two's still fucked up. That's why I wasn't here for the the podcast, the party cast earlier this week. And, uh... I don't know. My my tooth is fucked up and it's like not getting any better and I can't get into a dentist until like next month. Oh jeez. And it's it's there's an abscess, like it's visible and it hurts. The more the more I talk, the more irritated it gets. Did they give you anything for it? No, because I'm already on a shit ton of medication anyway. Oh man. So they won't give me any they won't even give me antibiotics until they see me. Because in order to take antibiotics i have to stop my other medication for two weeks jeez yeah because it makes the antibiotics not work in other news uh <laughs> our friend grant yeah. henry's here <laughs> Hi, <Grant>. hey. <laughs> hey what's going on uh, maybe i'll just i'll try and get loaded with you <laughs> i've had a lot of vicodin today <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you, are you feeling good at least, Cole? No. I am. Like I told Studa that I took my Vicodin early today because I needed to take it before the show, and I was like, one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to take the edge off a little bit, or it's going to make me so fucked up that I don't care. And if I'm lucky, it'll be a combination of both. Win win. Kind of at least hovering on the so fucked up I don't care part. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely there. <laughs> what level are you at, Grant? Uh, I'm just getting started. Uh, I would probably <laughs> have to go a while before I uh, hit level coal. Uh, <laughs> level we'll coal. Say. Uh. You would think that as long as I have been on these narcotics that I wouldn't react to them this way, but I do. That's why I usually wait till after the show to take my meds. Here Damn. I am. <laughs> In all your glory... Yeah, <laughs> like you're just gonna start hearing me snoring about an hour, and that's gonna be it. <laughs> Mid review. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, well, the graphics and the the, <laughs> the frame suck. <laughs> oh God, we lost Joe. We lost Joe. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm back. <laughs> That's how boring my show is. I That's put the funny. Host None to sleep. of us ever actually sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, Grant, how have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, uh, good. Uh, getting some work done. Getting some. Trying to get some game time in. I've played a couple things the last uh, few weeks, but um, yeah, things are good. Things are good. It's uh, the month's over. What the hell? So, I don't know. Uh, I'm getting. I'm getting. Uh, I'm pretty busy with with the music work this the, uh, these days some some fader pushing and some creative stuff so uh it's going all right joe so far what are you so. allowed to talk about i know some stuff you're probably not allowed to discuss but uh what are you allowed to talk about uh i just finished let's see i just finished uh mixing a couple records uh i finished mixing the new kirby's dream band album which nice. is uh i don't know when that's coming out but it's done I finished mixing the new Ch- uh, Cheap Dinosaurs album, which came out at MAGFest, but is not online yet, but it's going to be at some point. That's real good. Uh, and I just finished a new record by a band called Bonehenge, which is a uh, sort of a theatrical uh, rock and roll with the hints of ska and punk band all about dinosaurs. They wear these giant dino skulls <laughs> when they play, <laughs> and they cover topics uh, from everything but uh, brontosauruses that eat eat nothing but weed. Uh, the oh my lord. The uh, the um, uh, what do you call um, guys that study dinosaurs? I'm getting tired. 
uh, paleontologist battle of 1870 when, when, you know, digging dinosaur bones was just as hot as the gold rush. <laughs> uh, all kinds of shit. It was super fun to mix. Yeah, I just finished that record. It's real good. Uh, and then I'm doing some stuff for a game and then, uh, I don't know. That's it. That's been the last couple of weeks. So doing that's, stuff that's, for a game. That sounds like uh, like a topic that would work well on a podcast about games. It will. It would. It will. Uh, it'll be a little bit before I can say anything. But uh, uh, still too early on that one. Yeah, still too early on that one. But it's cool. It's it's exciting. So uh, yeah, super cool. And I have some live gigs. Um, I just finished. A, I played a live show as Stemage, my solo show, non Metroid show. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and I have a couple more of those set up for the, the for, for, uh, earlier this year too. So I'm excited about that. So what do you what do you play at those shows? Well, I play my solo stuff that is original, and then I've been playing arrangement stuff. Uh, I haven't played like any of the new game music I've written because a lot of that hasn't been very guitar-y, But I played like an old Alpha Squad track, uh, and I played a bunch of the uh, game arrangements that I've done that's not Metroid. So some Marble Madness stuff, uh, random games, odds and ends. Tetris and Mario Galaxy and stuff like that. So it's like a chance for me to play stuff live that I don't never I've never played live before because I've never play had some a band. Narrow to play. band. Yeah, there's some there's some there's some NB in there. <laughs> I need to edit the video that plays behind it and get some get Joe's mug up there. Oh God! Uh, what like Lonely but, Rolling Stars used to do? Have my yeah, face dude. up on screen? Yeah, dude. <laughs> I remember that discussion. Clearly, <laughs> how how was the discussion on that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I just remember it was a call out because of um, it was a Sonic call out, wasn't it? I can't remember. Why do we have you up there? What song was it during? I don't remember because I it can't just remember. Looped. I think those are all online somewhere. I need to go find those. Too old to remember that shit. Oh my god, it's been for it's been, that was like six years ago. Um, but yeah, I need to. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to remember. There's a reason we called your ass out, and I can't remember what it was. That was like a hundred million episodes ago of the show. Who knows what we were talking about back then? Probably talking about like the end gauge and Tiger R Zone. Hi, yes, Tiger Electronics Double Dragon LCD. <laughs> you know it. Terrible, terrible. God, those Tiger Electronics handheld games were awful. You know they're bad, but like they were fun, and you didn't no, they really weren't. I mean, when Are you, you were high? When you were nine. I, am, I remember playing the shit out of them. High or fun. nine. You know, I, I remember there was one, there were a couple that were actually kind of fun, but all the branded ones were pretty terrible. They tried to shoehorn characters in there and it just wasn't, there wasn't much to it. But there were a couple that were a little more like, um, a little more like breakout in style that were kind of fun. I have, I have one that I picked up from, uh, uh, gosh, I picked it up. I, I, it's an LCD, a Tiger Electronics LCD pinbot game. Uh, oh it's my an God. actual, they actually took a license for pinbot and made like a little two button pinball game. It's not bad. Uh, it doesn't have any sound, but it does play. I'll have to take a picture of it and send it to you. It's pretty rad. Yeah, do that. We can make that the the picture for the episode on on YouTube. I'll I'll, I'll hit you up with that here. I'm good sorry. Stuff. What were we talking about? I don't remember. <laughs> good to see you guys. <laughs> good to hear you guys. We missed you, Grant. <laughs> you too. It's always good having you on, Grant. We we love having you on. We love chatting with you. We love playing your music on the show, obviously. We uh past couple of episodes we've been playing stuff from the uh the Cards of Darkness remix album. Mm. Rad. I've missed the last couple episodes. That's freaking cool. Why don't, you, why don't you tell us about that album? That album, um oh my gosh, that happened. Uh that was the tail <laughs> the tail end of last year. So Card of Darkness is an Apple Arcade game that came out um, when Apple Arcade launched, which I guess was September, so somewhere in there. And I did the music for it. So it's that gauge game. And then my buddy, uh, Muhammad, uh, who runs, uh, Muhammad and Alex, who run Brave Wave, uh, which is a, a record label that will re reissues old soundtracks and also gets a lot of uh, uh, Japanese composers to do new original stuff. Uh, he was a huge fan of that game. He loved the game and he loved the soundtrack. And he's like, we should totally curate a an arrangement record for this thing. We should get some get some people on board and see if people dig the music. And so he knew a number of people and I knew some. And we just sort of farmed it around. And everyone bit. Like everyone found a track that they, um, they were interested in covering. So we ended up getting uh, composers from Panzer Dragoon and MGS4 and Sonic Mania. Uh, we got Vince DiCola on there. 
Yeah, this isn't uh, something just, where you got like a whole bunch of fan remixes. Like these are legit big time composers. Yeah, who they did got these. All, it was it was nuts. It, it was like they were interested in, and the songs they chose were peculiar. And it ended up being that the whole soundtrack ended up getting being done. Um, it ended up having some songs touched by all the, all the songs were were done. Is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say. There was one that was not done no one picked hushed wall from the soundtrack so i hit up the boys in super strikers which is one of the bands i'm in which is some of the guys in cheap dinosaurs and this guy apoc we played the that was the retroactive band from years ago at magfest and we covered it so we covered my we my band covered my song from this game uh which was kind of odd i just sort of left it to them to do the arrangement and then i w- came back and put guitar on it but that was the last track to get touched but the whole soundtrack got addressed and uh our act of the art and it came out in december and it was just the f- most humbling thing in the world to have these legendary composers uh, arrange my shit it's weird i didn't realize you were part of super strikers so that's cool that you're on your own remix album yeah, it was really weird. I, I was like, maybe I should cover one of my own songs. I'm like, that's dumb. I'll just do that on my own <laughs> live stuff. I'll I'll do a real dumb metal arrangement of one of my own songs uh, and play it live. But the the Super Strikers is kind of a brave wave band anyway, so it made sense uh, kind of thematically. So uh, yeah, we ended up doing that, and it ends up sounding kind of like a like a weird old early '80s Goblin song or something. But it's uh, it's cool. But yeah, man, that was just a really that was just such a huge honor. Uh, ending the ending last year on a on a big note so um very thankful that got to to happen things have been moving man things are things are time moves so quickly now i just like for about about uh 10 minutes forgot that album existed <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> just hanging out talking about games and then yeah uh that was just crazy you so, forgot it existed uh, you know you know what i mean i'm proud of you grant <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, how are you holding up? I'm not dead. <laughs> I found it, but I'm not. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much where I'm at right now. Just ow. Just ow. Trying to get you involved in this conversation. <sighs> I did laugh. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Grant, what have you been playing? Uh, I, uh, let's see. I, I played through Sayonara Wild Hearts, um, which was cool. I am jealous. I want to play that. Have you not played it? No, not yet. I've so, seen it played, but I haven't played it. You can blast through it in about, it's about an hour and a half, I'd say. I think it maybe, maybe a little over, a little under, depending on how, uh, how, how good you are with it. Kind of, it's a very, uh, it gets a little, it, it's, 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 you don't really die. You just sort of mm-hmm. do do parts over and over again it's very much sort of a roller coaster um and i it's really beautiful it's really lavish and sounds great i think it's one of those games where i think i'd probably recommend it harder to friends if i was more into the music part of it Mm -hmm. uh like the actual music itself just the kind of music's not really my thing it's very sort of high high energy pop um but it's really well done it's just a beautiful i thought about Picking it up for number one because she's really into rhythm music type games. Um, she picked up that uh, how's that pronounced? A Avicii and Vector is that mm-hmm. it? Yeah, she picked that up last month and she's been going hard on it. She absolutely loves it. Cool. Have you she's seen a- that game, Grant? No, I don't think so. What's it called? Avicii and Vector. And Avicii and Vector. I wonder if Google will attempt to correct my <laughs> spelling there. It did. <laughs> cool. I'll check it out. This looks interesting. This is kind of like uh, it almost looks like a frequency-ish kind of thing. Frequency amplitude. Mm. Oh, what was the other one that? Was? I want to say Red Out, not Red Out. Arrow. It's very similar to Arrow. If you played that one, I have not. God damn it. Grant, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm definitely not playing Avicii and Vector and Arrow. So I, have to fix that. I recommend this, them both. Who's this dude? I just want to know who the dude is on the... Well, uh, on the uh, his name was Avicii, and he was a DJ, but he committed suicide last year. Wow. Yeah. But the game was in production before he died. 
And so they went ahead and finished it in his honor. Wow, that's incredible. And it features his music. All the all the music is his music. That's wild. Yeah. Man. Thanks for the lead on that. I will check that out. Yeah, yeah, it's a really it's, solid game too. It really cool. and the music is really good. I'm not usually like I'm pretty picky. I listen to Incubus and not much else. Incubus <laughs> and like Bon Jovi. <laughs> okay, we are on the exact same page, so <laughs> <laughs> And so like I was but I I ended up going and adding a few of his songs to my Spotify playlist after the uh number one was playing the game because I really liked them. That's cool. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah, it came out recently, December tenth. So yeah, uh, it's not like an old game. Okay, neat. I, I just missed this one. It's it's well worth the twenty bucks. Yeah, cool. It's very pretty. This is my kind of aesthetic. I love this stuff. So. And I uh, would also recommend Aero or A E R O. Okay. That's another one in the same kind of genre. Yeah, this is very much like it looks kind of like a frequency uh, thing, which was my uh, the treadmill, the pre Guitar Hero era. Mm-hmm. Um. So interesting. Yay, nice lead. Yeah, uh, it's really cool. I will say, too, there's a lot of original music, but there's also this incredible electronic arrangement of Claire de Lune, which is one of my favorite pieces of classical music mm-hmm. ever. Uh, and it's so awesome. It's like the first level. And then they they play a little, little, little later, too. But, man, it's so good. But, uh, yeah, maybe number one would like it. It's not quite as uh, rhythmy as it is rez-type, rez-ish, I think. Yeah. But there are Rez-ish. rhythmic elements. It, yeah, do you mm-hmm. remember... Do you remember Elite Beat Agents? Oh, I loved Elite Beat Agent. I love the yeah. uh, the the Japanese versions more. The Owen Don games. Yes, Wendon. Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh boy, that just came. Uh, uh, Memories came, came back. Memories rushing back. back. I forgot what it was called. I forgot what the original was called because that came out first. I had that uh, imported that. But yeah, the, there's like there's some game gameplay, gameplay similar to that, uh, oh. but it's not a ton. That's more for like interstitials, little moments in between the gameplay but uh it's cool so i played through that uh played through uh freedom finger uh oh i heard about that one yeah it was on sale it's just a shmup where you play a hand that's a giant middle finger <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like uh i remember that remember we talked one? about this yes we did talk about this in one. an interview as soon as he said the middle finger, I was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> I even remember looking up the screenshots. It's pretty cool. It's it's uh, it's a shmup, except it's uh, it's pretty it's rooted in, in cartoon graphics and comedy, like uh, Team America style comedy, mm-hmm. slightly dated, uh, overly American <laughs> shtick, the whole thing, like you're the freedom finger, like it's that thing. Uh, and then every level has a really rad song. They just licensed music for their soundtrack. Uh, there's a so- there's a level that has Danimal's music on there. Danimal Cannon. Really? Yep. Uh, it's got a bunch of weird sludgy stuff and King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizards on there, who I like. Uh, but it's cool. It's just kind of, it's it's really more fun to listen to than to play. I think it's not the best shmup. The hitboxes are weird and the, it just doesn't f- have a lot of flow to it compared to other shmups, but it's kind of funny. I think it's kind of like, if you can stomach that humor, uh, I think it's fun. But uh, it's definitely a wait for a sale kind of game, I think. What what did uh, you play it on? Played on Switch. Switch. Yeah. Sort of went on a rampage of like Switch sale stuff. Um, Switch sales don't fuck around, man. Like, you'll, you'll be on the, the Switch store and you'll be like, hey, a game for 19 cents? Yeah, why not? Let's try it. Yeah, that's kind of a thing. It's a lot. Of, you end up in, um, and not all of them are really like mobile territory either. There's a game called, um, oh crap, what's it called? It's a game where you play a uh, uni. It's a game where you play like a like a unicycle with a wheel on each side, top and bottom, and you can flip around. I cannot light. I've like, seen that. I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember the name. It's fantastic. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I have to pull it up on my. Switch if I can't think of it, but it was you like have to it's, match I think the it's, colors. I think it's like yes, you have to match the colors. I think it's like it's like two bucks right now, and it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's awesome. I beat it like completely, um, but I can't remember what it's called because I'm a dork. <laughs> the the girls will save up any like change they get. We have a rule that when whoever's doing laundry, if you find money in dad's pocket, it's yours, <laughs> and we call it laundry loot. Oh, that's good. laundry loot. And then they'll take it and, like, you know, they have jars in their rooms with their names on it. And they'll put their laundry loot in the jars. And uh, then number three is, like, 
a magnet she can find whenever dad loses change in the couch. Like, it's nobody's business. <laughs> and <laughs> so they'll, like, fill up their little jars and then they'll go and trade them in for eShop cards. And then they'll get on there and they'll be like, oh, this is 10 cents, this is 20 cents. And <laughs> they might only have five bucks and they walk away with like 15 games. And I'm yeah. like, okay, then have fun. <laughs> and then they do that and then they sit there and they play Pokemon because they've already mastered the art of creating a backlog. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm so proud. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I love it. And it's Joe's fault because that's where they got Pokemon from. <laughs> You're welcome. You know the number one or number three didn't trade in her laundry loot for a gift card this time for the e card. She wanted a, a skin for her switch. And do you know what she chose? Hmm. Pokemon. Nice. <laughs> She's so in. then we were sitting here trying to put that damn skin on it for. <laughs> She's very happy. Speaking of themed Switches, this is a good way to introduce some of the news of the week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you see the new Switch that Nintendo just announced? It's so pretty. It is designed around Animal Crossing New Horizons. It is coming Mm -hmm. to the market March 13th. The system will include pastel green and blue Joy-Con and a white Switch dock adorned with Tom Nook and the Nooklings. It's, It's very pretty. It looks delicious. It it's looks also adorable. Not cheap. <laughs> no, it's it's two ninety nine, same as pretty much every other Switch. Yeah. Uh, it does not include the game. The game launches the following week on the twentieth. That's kind of crazy, though. But at it's, least it's when Nintendo. Xbox does a themed one, it comes with the game. <laughs> it's a Nintendo. Nintendo gun and Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised to see them do a themed Switch. That doesn't seem like it's been something they do often. There have been a handful, but not that many. I know there was a yeah. Diablo one that Chris I didn't really ex- wanted. I, didn't ex- I remember there being a Zelda one, too. But I didn't, I didn't see Animal Crossing being one that they would do a theme for. It's pretty, though. It is. Grant, and did Twitter you see pictures has lost of it? their shit over it. Yeah, it's, it looks, looks yummy. I want to eat it. <laughs> want to eat it. It does. It does kind of look like <laughs> like pastel ice cream. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, yeah, like it's I got can this. See it. Okay, yeah, pastel is the word for sure. Pastel bluish something. It's very nice. It's a very nice color. Uh, I always get weirded out with light colors on on stuff that I'm touching a lot for fear mm-hmm. of of goo, uh, dirtying them up. But I think this is this was actually be a really. It's a it's a very nice uh, uh, very nice color. I like it. It's, cool. it's a sweet looking system. Yeah. I, and, uh, I should put a timer and see how long it takes the kids to destroy that skin. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, do they make them do they make them so you can uh kind of take stuff off and put it put it back on like uh mm-hmm. resealable, you know? Yeah, like I yeah, because when uh my husband I love him, but he's terrible at like lining up stickers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, Hey yeah, I put the controller, let's put it on the Joy Cons for you and I was like, Oh my god. And like they were so far off base from where they should have been. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. And so I pulled them motherfuckers off and put them right back on. <laughs> they did fine. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> I love my husband, but that's putting on stickers and decal. Anything that needs precision, not in his wheelhouse. <laughs> I I used to be the pro at putting on stuff like that, like screen protectors. I would always be the guy. And in recent years, I've just my skills have gone away. I can't do it without <laughs> getting air bubbles or a piece of dust. I could be in a hyperbaric chamber. There could be nothing around, just <laughs> floating, floating on the water. And a piece of dust would land on it as I'm putting the screen protector on. <laughs> it would ju- it would just happen. It um it's impossible for me to actually accomplish those anymore. I'm terrible. I used to, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the um the when the when the GBA first came out? The original version pre SP was not backlit, and mm-hmm. you could buy you could buy this kit called the Afterburner, and it was this kit you bought, and you could install a backlight into the screen, uh, and to install this thing. You the, the, their their method their recommendation for getting dust out of a room was to steam up your bathroom, <laughs> and then turn all the water off, leave the door shut, let all the steam settle. Apparently, that brings the dust to the, to surfaces, gets the dust out, 
And then you go in there and do freaking open heart surgery on your GBA. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I, I, I don't. This is pre screen protect. I mean, I probably this was cell phones existed. This is pre smartphone. So uh, I probably had something on my screen. I don't remember, but there was no way I was going to do that. And I found some dude who did it for a living. He just installed afterburners. So I sent him my GBA and had him install an afterburner. Oh, that uh, works. No dust. He did a great job. I would love to know what his method was, but apparently if you want to steam the bathroom and wait 15 minutes, that's a way to, to get a dust-free environment. Or they're totally full of shit, but uh, <laughs> that's what I'm told. I don't know. Give it a shot. Let me know if it works out. I don't, I don't care enough. Me neither. You know what my favorite part of the Switch is? Is the back of it. Why the back of it? Have you seen the back of the Switch? It's got like, it looks like a little... Animal Crossing Island, it's it's parts of the Switch are um, glossy and parts are matte. Have you seen this? No. Uh, go to the, if there's there's a Verge article that has, it uh, just happens to be the one I'm looking at, and it shows the back of the, let me get this in chat here. here I'll put it in the uh, Twitch chat. This is, this is a lot of help for the people who are listening to the MP3 version. Sorry. But it's basically <laughs> if you if you look at the back, it's it's basically a matte finish like the regular switch, but they've made certain parts glossy. They basically drew sort of water in an island and trees and houses and stuff and gloss. Ooh. It looks really rad. Ooh, that looks really nice. I didn't see that, no. And also the backs of the Joy Cons are a different color than the fronts of the Joy Cons. Also kind of cool. Yeah, um, they're, they're white and uh then the teal blue and teal green. Man, they're so pretty. I kind of want this now. <laughs> it's like the, you know, Animal Crossing is like the nicest game on the planet. This is the nicest switch ever. I guess it makes sense, right? Uh, I'll, just, even I'll the, trade my switch in and just buy a new switch. And this case is cool too. I know it anyway. looks so good. So you're getting a case out of it. Yep. Does it include the case or is that sold separately? Oh, I don't know. Who, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, will be available separately starting March 13th. Okay. Well, you just want to get yourself a, uh, what is that? That's not teal. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, Urban nice Outfitters. Light blue. It's, it's Urban Outfitters blue. <laughs> Urban Outfitters uh, blue. With, with leaves on it. You know, get yourself one. Get equipped. <laughs> get equipped. <laughs> That's beautiful. Get equipped with Urban Outfitters switch case. Speaking of the Actually, Switch, some more uh, some more news we could talk about. The Switch worldwide sales are now over fifty two and a half million units sold. That's I did insane. my part. <laughs> that is ridiculous. Fifty two and a half million. That's so many. That's more than SNES, right? Isn't that? Did I see that today, or was that not correct? I think so. I think Super Nintendo was like forty one. Oh man. Yeah, and then Pokemon Sword and Shield sales are over 16 million. What is, is that? That's, the mo- that's ridiculous. 16 million copies. And that's just that just came out. That's mm-hmm. not a uh, that's a new game. November wasn't that yeah. when it came out? Good yeah. grief! Wow. Man, I feel like I should try it. I've never tried Pokemon. The kids have had a blast. With I it. say this every year. I should try Pokemon. I'm not gonna. I'm, just, I'm probably not gonna do it. New Year's resolution: Play Pokemon. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Cold when I want to make my like kids Pokemon. mad, I call them Digimon instead. <laughs> Digimon. <laughs> That's how I get Down in your trouble. Digimons. <laughs> Come eat your dinner. <laughs> There's a lot of switches. That is. They're they're I'm watching up to Sony. <laughs> I think that there's I think it's uh, one of the biggest reasons. I mean, there's a lot to be said about Nintendo and nostalgia and all of that, but I think the fact that the Switch fills a void in the handheld market, and I think that might be its biggest qualifier for a lot of people. Yeah, I feel like it's a great. It's I don't know. They always talk about Nintendo systems being great, a great great second console. Um, and also one that's just easy to, there's, I don't know, I don't feel like your doesn't take up space in your entertainment center if you don't want it to. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Apparently there's a market for that because the light's selling well. Uh, it just kind of does everything. It didn't, it didn't, you know, I mean, not that like the handheld market is big at all outside of uh, the Switch anyway, because phones are great and you don't really need them. But uh, yeah, gosh, it does, it does it all. 
So apparently the NES is the next system to beat. 61 million. Hmm. Wow. What's uh what's the Xbox One at? Xbox One, let me scroll down here. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> forty six estimated. That's estimated. Forty six. No. Three sixty is at eighty four. Uh PlayStation four. Is it which like a hundred something? Uh This is what we're going to spend the episode doing, just looking up sales figures. Yeah, well, I'm looking at one chart. So, yeah, PlayStation 4, 106 million. Woo! That's a lot, Goodness. Of, that's a lot of PS4s. That is you a guys, lot of PS4s. You guys know what the number one is? I know you do. Uh, Is it the PS2 still? It is. I was about to say, if it's not the GameCube, I'm mad. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Even though I know it's not. Scroll down. <laughs> Far down I for the GameCube. I love the GameCube, Game man. Oh, I love my, I love my purple lunchbox. I, I adored that thing. I still have one hooked up. Mm-hmm. Good man, good man. I, uh, yeah, Tony Hawk Three, I think, was the only launch game I bought for that system. I was like, I don't want any of this other stuff. I want Tony Hawk Three, and that was what I bought. And Dude, I Monkey it. Ball, man. How could you not get Monkey Ball? I didn't like it. I didn't, it was so. I felt like it was. It was just the world moving around was not something that I enjoyed. Uh, I thought about it, but I was like, this doesn't feel like a $50 game. So I went for Tony Hawk 3. And you missed out. Yeah. Monkey Target with friends was amazing. Those awesome. days were just incredible. GameCube, $21 million. That's it? That's it. Damn. Wow. I did my part there as well. <laughs> oh, man. The Wii U, 13. Uh, what was that one, 13? 13.5. Damn. Good job, Wii U. You tried. <laughs> oh my god. What a uh, dumb U. damn name, though. Oh, I know. Wii U was only sold 3 million more than the Game Gear. It's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I forgot that Jeez. thing existed. Oh, man. Anyway, there is some bad news coming out this week. Uh, Fable Fortune, it was announced that the servers for that game will be shutting down on March 4th. Hmm. I don't remember what that is. Uh, Fable card game. Oh, okay. I wonder if it's got enough uh, enough of a fandom to get someone to put up something private. Is that is that a PC thing or is that something else? Uh, it's also on Xbox, but I don't believe you can get it anymore. I believe they took it down from sale a little bit ago. Oh wow! Yeah. What was a there free to, it was a free to play game with there, microtransactions? Anyway. Yeah, it's just a bummer to see another game come down and go away. Yeah. That's the world we live in. Games are no longer permanent. Yeah, I mean, as long if people aren't playing them, they're just going to vaporize, you know. And it's, it's interesting, but yeah. but I think though that there's there's a pretty healthy community who strive to keep games alive even after the developers let them go. Totally, totally. That's why I was asking if it was PC because that makes it way easier to hack up, you know, yeah. from a good co- host a server. I'm sure there'll be at least somebody out there that manages to keep it in existence to some extent. I believe there are very active servers for uh, Tony Hawk's Underground 2 <laughs> or something. Is that I right, Joe? I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be I shocked. I think that's the one. You could go like load that game up and jump into a game with like 10 people right now, probably, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> Oh, man. We should get to some actual news. There is some other news that we have to go over this week. Uh, Games with Gold and PlayStation Plus lineups for February were both announced, as well as the Stadia Pro game lineup. Yay. Oh, my God. (laughs) Hey, it's news. (laughs) We're sitting here padding this shit out now. (laughs) I am curious. week. I am curious, though. I didn't know Stadia was doing, like, the game giveaway thing and how, how frequently, so... Yeah, they, they've they been doing games monthly. They've been adding two games a month. Uh, and February's lineup is Metro Exodus and Guilt, which you might recall, Guilt is the ah. only exclusive they have. And I was super mad about it. It looked incredible. Hmm. It's kind of crazy they're giving it away already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I pre-ordered one of those, uh, and then back two or three months before it came out, I canceled it. And it was like, I, I didn't, I just wasn't seeing the games, you know. So I just, I, I casually canceled. I'm like, I'll get it later. But I'm glad I didn't. 
Are you, are you like crisis averted? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, unless things, you know, unless things pick up or whatever or work well, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the idea of a game that can only run in the cloud that you can, you know, is, is interesting to me, but they have just been running subpar versions of console games, which is a joke. So yeah. that's like, give me a break, you know, uh, anyway, weird. What's, what's the, what's the PS4 or what was it? Uh, the Xbox, Xbox and PlayStation both announced theirs. PlayStation plus lineup is, uh, Bioshock, the collection, the Sims four, and then they're giving away a bonus PSVR game with Firewall Zero Hour. Hmm. That's a, a pretty solid lineup of games on PlayStation Plus. That's pretty great, actually. I, don't, I never played Bioshock 2. Um, well, now you, you play get all three of them. Do you guys play this, the second one? Mm-hmm. No, I haven't played any, but I won the whole Bioshock Remastered trilogy, like the whole thing when they re-released it. It's still over here in the plastic. <laughs> it's one of the few games I have on disc. <laughs> and it's still just sitting over there in the plastic. That's a shame. You should fire it up. And I know, like, I know it's a good series and I would enjoy it. And I just haven't found time for it. <laughs> it's pretty great. It's pretty, well, the first game's great. I, I liked, uh, I liked, um, uh, by Infinite. That was the yeah. one in the air. I, I liked Infinite more than most people. Apparently, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it too. I so liked Infinite. They're, yeah. they're there when you want to get to them, Cole. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I find my way through the the thousand game backlog. That's right. <laughs> Cole, what are your thoughts on The Sims Four going free on PlayStation Plus? I'm not surprised. It was free on Origin for a little while too. So it's it's the second time around that it's been free somewhere. Um, maybe they'll, maybe they'll make it free on Xbox eventually, which would be great because then there would be a sale on all that sweet, sweet DLC that I don't have yet. (laughs) I have an addiction. How how much of the DLC do you have? I probably have about two thirds of it. Jesus. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I yeah. am obviously in no position to be surprised given my rock band collection. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, well, I only get them when they're on sale. So, like, if the stuff packs get marked down to $4 from 10 I'm going to grab two or three of them. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, I'll get a lot of the, um, they do the bundles where you get like an expansion pack, a stuff pack, and a theme pack. And instead of being like thirty dollars just for the expansion, you get two other packs along with it. Yeah. And they usually Didn't knock I it down to like twenty five. You did. I think you I think you might have gifted me two of them actually. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I've and I know I bought that they went like deep sale one point and I bought like two of them myself. So I've got, I've got quite a few of them. The new one that came out in December, I don't have yet discover university. Mm. Um, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been cut down yet either. So give me time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, didn't they release a pack for a tiny houses recently or something? They did. Yeah. I, they did tiny houses. I don't have that one yet either. It's an interesting yeah. idea. It's sort of like the constraints of the size of your place. To, uh-huh. to it's almost it almost turns it into like a like a puzzle game or a another well, kind of Sims. Thing. In a lot of ways, has has always been like that because when you start off, you have such a small budget to work with that unless you use a cheat. And so you're like trying to to afford the shit you need. And my method to always deal with it was just stick them in the tiniest place I could build. Like, bitch, you get a one room house. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you're pulling it. You're basically pulling a Pittsburgh. <laughs> you, know, you know, like like the Steel City. Uh, you know, make all the houses tall. Get them close. Yeah, together, you know? <laughs> I've done that. And uh, so I mean, it's it's neat that there's finally like stuff that fits in with that gameplay as opposed to just like fuck I have to make a room giant because I need three squares for a bathtub yeah right so it's just nice to I'm curious to see like what all the kind of options they added especially because they've added some features in other stuff packs like did they make a compact washer and dryer 
because if it there's there's laundry now, you you gotta fucking wash your clothes. <laughs> so if you're living in a tiny house, you don't got room for a washer and dryer. Is there a compact one? I really need to go and like look that shit up because I haven't. I tend to like to be surprised when that shit comes out. Like I won't look at what's in a stuff pack. I just take you should the theme probably of face research value. what you're buying. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's a Sims, and I know I like it. Just so blind faith. And just dive just into be it. like, they ain't let me down yet. <laughs> so <laughs> and even if it's not one that I enjoy, it might be one that number one enjoys, because she plays a lot, too. Mm. So I have usually, a question. usually between the two of us, we're good. I have a question. So, who makes Sims for? Maxis. Does Maxis exist still? Yes. Oh, I thought they like. I thought they shut down post Sim City. I they, was wrong. I don't know what happened. Like, I'm not sure of like the logic between everything that happened or the the lore <laughs> as far as Maxis goes. The lore. Um, they did one and two, but three was done by a different studio. Okay. And then they come back for four. Okay, that's cool. I'm glad they're around. I thought they. Mm-hmm. I thought something happened and they got. I, I will or say. Um, a lot of people were really unhappy with it, though, and there's still a lot of complaints because a lot of the progress that we made between two and three was lost. Was, the Maxis was just like, no, this is how we made it. This is how we wanted it to be. And a lot of the things that people liked about three, they, they just took out. Like when four launched initially, it didn't even have toddlers. Just babies went straight to being kids again. Damn. And even as it is now... A lot of people are, are annoyed because babies are just objects. They just lay in the bassinet. Like in three, we had cribs and they could climb out of them and, and you could carry the kids around when they were toddlers and take them places. And, and, uh, even brand new babies, like with, with four, they've gone back to the way it was in two where like literally the sim just sits there and holds it and that's all they can do with it. It's an object. But in, Three, like, your sim could sit down and watch TV while holding the baby and eat while holding the baby and talk to other people while holding the baby, and they can't do that anymore in four. It was such a weird thing to revert back. And then to get rid of toddlers completely, like, it was it was a good six months after the game came out before they were like, oh, fine, your toddler's back. <laughs> and you're like, why would you take them out in the first place? They were one of the best parts of three. It was one of the biggest upgrades. So, yeah, Maxis, for for all their effort of, hey, we made the original and we're going to take The Sims back to what it was, you know, they, they fucked up and took out a lot of the good stuff people liked. Yeah, but, but hey, they're selling we, it to you later. So <laughs> Yeah, but uh, hey, I guess we got cow plants back, so that's great. <laughs> it was oh, such a weird thing. <laughs> so they've had to, for all of their progress in making like all the moods and everything and all the emotions and all the customization they they lost some really cool features that they've had to backtrack on and instead of progressing they're like filling in the void of what they took out it's very weird oh well still a good lineup for playstation plus yeah yeah i mean the sims and I already Sims forgot what the other one was. Sims Bioshock. and Bioshock. And then uh, yeah. and the, a VR bonus, game. the bonus it's, PS yeah. VR game, Firewall like, Zero Hour. It's four games in a VR game. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. man, I'll take it. I'll, I'll go download them or I'll go claim them and not download them right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to wait until they're available. Son of a gun. <laughs> Uh, and then there's Xbox Games with Gold for February that was also announced on the Xbox 360 side of things for the uh, the first half of the month. The first through the 15th, you get Fable Heroes. And then uh, the 16th through the 29th, Star Wars Battlefront from the OG Xbox. Yeah. Which... I don't think that there's a single Star cool. Wars game in existence that they haven't given us yet. <laughs> Except for, like, the most recent one. Give them time. Yeah, probably. probably. <laughs> I'm in the Fable middle of that Hero- one too. It's Fable really Heroes is cool though. That was a fun game. I didn't know. I didn't ever play it. Well, it'll be free, so now you'll have your chance. Yeah, yeah in like six years. <laughs> I'll be like, oh fuck, I forgot about this. 
I remember talking about this on on the show back in 2020. <laughs> back in the day, the glory days. Oh my god. Back when Joe was still alive. <laughs> no. God damn it, Joe. <laughs> Can't oh, keel man. over you, the provider of my codes. <laughs> 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 oh, man. And then on the Xbox One for the entire month of February, uh, you were getting TT Isle of Man. You reviewed that one, didn't you? I think I did. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, I think I did. I don't remember shit about it, though. Wait, is that the <laughs> motorcycle? Terrible. Is it the motorcycle game? Yep. Yeah, the Isle of Man, huh? Yep. Well, you don't remember. Be. You don't like, remember if you reviewed remember, it, so you I must have made a huge impression. What, uh, there's there's just certain <laughs> games that I have to review at times, even though they may not be what I would normally gravitate toward. Sure. And that was one of them. <laughs> and then I just like I, I sometimes my review has to take like an objective approach. Where I can't be like, oh my god, I love this so much, it was great. I have to be like, yeah, it worked, and it's fine, it's just not for me. But that doesn't mean it's bad. (laughs) And that was where we were with that one, and I was like, this is not meant for me. And that's okay. But it's still good. Yeah, and And then I just want to forget about it. So (laughs) There's plenty of people who will be happy with it, Yeah, even if I wasn't. And then February 16th through March 15th, Call of Cthulhu. That was a good game. Weird. Which was probably why it's straight up my alley. But it was a good game. <laughs> but yeah, that is the lineup for games with gold and PlayStation Plus. Overall, good months for both consoles. Yeah. Can't be mad at anyone. What's uh, what's free on Switch this month? T- nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Switch doesn't do that. <laughs> I think there's a bunch of shitty mobile ports for 10 cents each. 10 cents. <laughs> I'm waiting for the next uh, next lineup of NES and Super Nintendo games for their online yeah, service. They used to be very, monthly. Been very slow with that, but yeah, um, you know, it is what it is. I miss when they were monthly and they would announce them, and you would have four to eight new games to play every month. And now it's just whenever they feel like adding some, they add a couple. Damn. Yeah. No. Oh, well, what are you gonna do? Not get free Nintendo games. <laughs> but yeah, that's the news. I got anything either of you want to talk about? News. What happened that you didn't talk about? Nothing. That's it. That's all the news. Next. Next. Are we doing reviews then? Hell yeah. <laughs> what are you asking? I don't I'm, know. I'm asking you since you're here, Grant. I'm here. Why? Well, I'm here, right? You are here. Are you ready to do your review? Yeah, I'm doing a review of uh, of Star Wars Jedi Order Fallen for the PlayStation <laughs> 5, kids. I just want to say, I think I'm three quarters through that game right now. It's really good. I the really like order. it. Oh, it's just so fucking... It's like Metroid Prime with really st- silly Dark Souls combat. I love it. I think it's great. I am. It's It's so pretty. I think we need to take a moment. And look at how pretty games are on the PlayStation 4 on a seven-year-old console. Same with Xbox One. How are they this pretty still after yeah. seven years? Like, they're gorgeous. They're 30 frames and kind of hitchy, but damn. Anyway, I just had have, to share that. Have you seen them on, like, the Xbox One X or the PS4 Pro? I was looking up a couple of things relating to story and things. I want to make sure I didn't miss things before I moved on. And I found some. I made the mistake of finding some PC footage which made me want to take my PlayStation and throw it into the street as a far path. <laughs> because I know that people get people, some people don't have good eyes and think there's no difference between 30 and 60 frames. But <laughs> my God, you play 20 hours of that game on, on PS4 and you look at a look at PC and it's like, Oh God, it's like, it's like butter. It's mm-hmm. like, Oh, good gravy. But no, I haven't seen it on uh, Xbox one X. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's beautiful. It is. Um, yeah. Nice, it's pretty. But anyway, that's yeah. why I, that's why I came. That's my review. I came right. Well, it was good I having you on the show, Grant. Nine midichlorians out of eight. <laughs> you were crazy, but there is a game that you are here to, to talk about this week that is called 1980X, developed by High Bit Studios, published by 8.4, released January 23rd on the Switch for 9.99. 
Part 1 of Arcade Epic 1980X, a coming-of-age story told through multiple games and genres, experienced the thrill of shooting, driving, jumping, fighting, and role-playing in five full-blown arcade stages, combined with cinematic pixel art storytelling. Grant, tell us about 1980X. Well, I didn't know this, but apparently it was a Kickstarter game uh, from a few years ago. It was successfully funded. Um, they were, I think it was posted in uh, the, it was a Swedish Kickstarter game. Uh, they asked for about 70 grand or so to, to bring it home. Uh, it was successful and was released, I believe, last summer on um, PC. I wasn't, I didn't realize this uh, at first, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it came out, I guess, last week. And it is essentially a, it's sort of a love letter to, uh, to 80s games in a few different ways. Uh, it is sort of a. It's a very confusing trailer because what what it what it sort of presents itself as is five different games. It looks like an R type game. It looks like Outrun. It looks like Shinobi. It looks like a best of collection of very familiar um, '80s arcade games. And that is kind of what it is. Uh, I think it may be a little bit misleading, but essentially it is a it is a narrative uh, game about a young man. Uh, growing up in 1980X, based on the type of games he's playing, I would say it's probably like 84, 85. Uh, and the story is told through uh, a non-interactive uh, pixel art sort of film. So when you're not playing these retro games, you're not playing the game. You're just sort of watching it. It's very much like watching a movie. Um, and it's a, it's sort of a, a story about this kid told through monologue, uh, voice acted, about him sort of going through the, the, uh, the, the, the experience of, of, uh, of, of like, let's say early high school, not a very pleasant time in a lot of people's lives. Uh, I was probably about this kid's age. I think about the time that he was, uh, this age in this game, I'm guessing, I'm not really sure, but, uh, yeah, so it's just sort of about him, you know, not enjoying school, not having a good, a good time at home and sort of discovering this arcade. It's done with really lavish, Pixel art, it's actually honestly one of the best looking pixel art games uh, and best sounding pixel art games I've, I've uh, played in a long time. But I say play loosely because the, these moments are not, they're not something that you're interacting with. It really is just an excuse to sort of show a series of, I guess, like pixel art set pieces, um, still shots of really, really cool uh, landscapes of the city. Uh, neon shots down alleyways, some animation, but it's not anything that you're really controlling. And this just sort of giant, big, uh, sort of synthwave soundtrack, uh, uh, piled on top. It's actually pretty amazing. It's gorgeous. It sounds great. Um, you want to know what else is pretty amazing? Awesome Prime dropping 10 biddies in chat. So thank you, Prime, for oh dropping, my. dropping bits. <laughs> thank you, Always Prime. Good. So uh, as you were saying, Grant. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Prime. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, it, is a, it is a story about this kid that uh, involves his experience at a local arcade. And when he goes into this arcade, you get a chance to experience the games that he's playing. And that is kind of the, that is kind of the, the big shtick in this game is they have created, uh, I believe five different retro arcade games inside of this game. There is a game called beating heart, which is pretty much, uh, a streets of rage inspired beat em up. Nice. There is one called out of this world, which is pretty much our type, like Gradius, <laughs> uh kind of game there is a game called the runaway which is basically sega's outrun um i mean and then these are now these are not like complete clones they play a bit differently they have their own mechanics whenever a game starts you hit a button to put a to put a credit in and then you start playing the game uh and you have no idea what you're doing uh, unlike in the arcade you can hit start and then check the controls real quick and it's normally two or three buttons to play these games and then you they are fully fl fleshed out games for about two levels. So you're going to play Streets of Rage, but you're going to play Streets of Rage for like two levels. Uh, if you die, uh, you can hit, throw another credit in and, re and, and respawn. Uh, they're not particularly difficult to beat. Some are a little longer than others, uh, but they're really just ways, they're just sort of these little uh, gaming moments in the middle of the story. Um I mentioned the Outrun game. There is one called Shadow Play, which is basically like the running sections of Shinobi. I think it's probably the best one of them. Uh, 
and all they're all incredibly unique. They're apparently all coded by the same people, but all play very differently. Very authentic, really cool soundtracks. And then the, the last game you play is a game called Kill Screen, which is essentially a take off a take of uh, of like an old dungeon crawler game, like Ultima or something. Like it's a uh, sort of going down a down a corridor and choosing whether you're fighting or running and uh, looting and that kind of thing. So five games nestled inside of this narrative and uh so you know not surprisingly the game is not very long i finished it in about an hour and a half about an hour and 45 minutes something like that not very long it is most of the time you are playing these games but it it's really only two levels or so of of gameplay for each one of these and i think that's my biggest gripe is that they just they made these systems for these games, they built them from the ground up. They're all very different, but they're not, they're just not long enough. Uh, I wish they were a good five levels each, or there was a way to maybe progress the story and choose to come back to these games to finish them later. But re- it really is uh, two levels per game and you're out and you're back in the story. You're back into the, the pixel art and the, and the cutscenes and putting your controller down. Um, I think the, it's very pretty. It's, it, it's, uh, it's great to listen to. I think the writing is, not good. Uh, I think it's very uh, kind of juvenile and surface. It, 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 there are only a couple of spots in the writing where it even refers to the kinds of things this kid is dealing with. A lot of it is just a lot of um, really just sort of generic uh, teenage complaints about things that are a bit nebulous. I think it's sort of trying to capture the overall attitude of a teenager at this time, no. but that is done done f- frequently enough now that um, I think it needed a little bit more. It needed a little bit. There's There are some references to problems at home and his dad not necessarily being there anymore, but there are very short lines. Uh, it doesn't last very long, and I feel like they really could have I could have been trying to get through the game and wanting to see what happened in the story instead of waiting through the story to play the next game. Um, so it kind of misses the mark there, I think. But uh, let me tell you, these games are fun. And there were two <laughs> or three of them that I went back and played. Like the the freaking R-Type one uh, is awesome. It's just it's just two levels long. Uh, I, I, I wish I, you know, they, I think Leave the game is only... wanting more. It did, it did. It leave me wanting, it wanted, I wanted less of the writing if I could just... Uh, look at it and listen to it, <laughs> and not have to li- not have to hear the hear the uh, hear the voice acting and 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 it just wasn't just wasn't didn't didn't stick the landing there. Uh, but in terms of the aesthetic and the games, like they're cool. There's just not enough of it. So I I, I think it's a ten dollar game. Is that yeah, what you overall said? ten bucks. What's your verdict? Uh, I would say that um. If you really, if you think, if, if you like the, the concept here uh, and you're okay with playing, getting really a sampling of some really de- well-designed games, knowing you, you know, your experience is only going to be about an hour and a half, similar to Sayonara Wild Hearts, which is also similarly priced, uh, I don't think you're going to be upset with this purchase. I think it might be worth keeping an eye on, maybe stick it in your wish list and watch for a sale if you're unsure. Uh, people seem pretty keen on it, but... Uh, yeah, it could it could have been longer, uh, and it's that's the thing is the games the games were made. It could have been longer. They could have spent a little more time with it and maybe charged fifteen bucks, and I'd yeah. be a little happier. So you want to know what uh, makes me happy? No that? time for games. Dropping fifty bits in chat. Uh, crap. Thank you so much for the fifty bitties. Bits! The best part is it was two bits at a time. So there's all these little heads falling down into the chat into the cup on screen and just starting to chug my computer there's <laughs> so many thumbs and heads in chat there there are so many but uh grant thank you as always for coming on and doing your thing yeah always a pleasure having Absolutely. you on uh we're gonna let you get going we have more show to take care of so do you have any final words before we let you go uh watch out for my review on sml podcast dot org for uh fallen order jedi coming to you next week for the playstation 6 take care sign it off love you guys thanks for having me on i hope to be on sooner rather than later all right grant thank you again for being here always good having him on yes it is grant's a good egg he is a good egg i love him yes he's good peoples yes we have more games to talk about yes we should probably talk about them Speaking of good eggs. Speaking of good eggs, are are there a lot of good eggs this week? There are. I was 
I was pleasantly surprised with how this week went. That is very good to hear. Well, let's get yeah. started because the first game to talk about is called Journey to the Savage Planet, developed by Typhoon Studios, published by 505 Games, released January 28th on Xbox One, PS4, and Epic Game Store for $29.99. Welcome to the Pioneer Program. In this upbeat and colorful co-op adventure game, you play as the newest recruit to Kindred Aerospace. Dropped onto an uncharted planet with little equipment and no real plan, you must explore, create, uh, catalog alien flora and fauna, and determine if this planet is fit for human habitation. But perhaps you are not the first to set foot here. Cole, tell us about Journey to the Savage Planet. I think one of the most humorous things about Journey to the Savage Planet is everybody being upset about having Savage in the name. But my entire experience with the game was everything on this planet is so fucking adorable. Why is that so cute? (laughs) I kept thinking, when does the savage part kick in that everybody's mad about? And then I'm just like, it's just cute. All this is so pretty. I cannot stress how pretty Journey to the Savage Planet is. When I saw it announced, I I believe it was E3. It was was the first time we saw it. Um, But when, when I saw it announced, I was like, wow, that's striking. But you never lose that. Oh kind of feel the whole time you're exploring like everything just catches your eye i think i think it's because i'm old and i come from an era when games had like two colors and it was like dark green and bright green (laughs) (laughs) and (laughs) there are still times when i play games this gen that are so vibrant and so colorful and so well designed. And they just seem surreal to me. And Journey to the Savage Planet falls into that. Um, if it seems like I'm harping really hard on how pretty it is, it's because it just is that pretty. And I will do that a <laughs> lot this week. Like, I think everything I played this week was just fucking gorgeous in one way or another. But... um Gameplay wise, it's first person shooter. You are an astronaut, an engineer, astro engineer. I don't know what the proper term for it would actually be for the fourth best interplanetary exploration. I can't remember the whole big thing. I just remember that it was the fourth best. The fourth best. And I was just like, that's so incredible. Your ship has crashed because that's what happens. And that you can't start a sci-fi game if the ship hasn't crashed. What are you doing? Yeah. So your ship has crashed and you need to go and explore things. And the game is just so overwhelmingly chalked with humor that from the very moment you find yourself back at your, at at your ship, you're just like, how am I going to play this and not giggle at everything this whole time? (laughs) Your ship is overrun with ads. They're the most hilariously ridiculous ads. There's an ad for the meat buddy, which is literally where you take your scraps of meat, raw, fleshy ass meat, and put it in a machine and it turns it into a sentient friend for you. <laughs> Who the fuck came up with that? <laughs> I want to shake their hand. <laughs> Why is that not a game all on its own? (laughs) I want a meat buddy game. (laughs) Maybe you were the meat buddy all along. (laughs) Oh, God. I need a drink. Holy shit. There is a meat buddy machine on the ship. (laughs) Can you buy one? If you can, I didn't get to it. Damn. Yeah. So, like, I would be very surprised. You can play the game in co-op. It would be hilarious if you could have your co-op partner look like a meat buddy. Mm. Also (laughs) terrifying. Uh (laughs) Yeah, we should point out this is a a co-op heavy game. Unfortunately, I wasn't able Mm -hmm. to play it with you. We were only able to get the one code to cover it, which I'm thankful for. I'm Mm -hmm. glad we're, we're able to make the game part of the show, but I'm dying to know how the game is and how how heavy into co-op it leans. I I have heard a lot of people say that co-op doesn't really change it much from the single player experience. I did play it single player. I didn't have a chance to drag my kids into it with me unfortunately. Um number one was trying to download it on her Xbox and it was going to take like 28 hours. 
Jeez. Because <laughs> I'm on wire or I'm on wired connections, but she's on wireless and it just slow as hell. And uh so she she never ended up getting a chance to actually chug into it and play it with me. But um playing alone, I I didn't ever think that it was difficult to a point that I needed somebody else. It's just what a it it's one of those you're gonna get into shenanigans in the first place. Get into shenanigans with a friend is probably better. You know? There's yeah. moments where you're like, I just wish I had somebody see me do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some incredible, incredible creatures roaming around on this planet. There's there's a puffer bird, for example, and like you you can feed them, which is very nice. But if you do too much, they go boom. <laughs> and then you feel guilty because they're like these super adorable little round balls with great big eyes and they love you. And then you just accidentally make one go boom. By and then you're like, it. oops. <laughs> or um, the worst part was, okay, so maybe I did find one part where it could technically be a savage planet. There are... There are vines that are like parasites, right? And in order to get them to go away, they have like a meat vortex attached to them. And the only way to satisfy that meat vortex's needs is with them little bitty puffer birds. (laughs) 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 And they're so adorable and cute with their great big eyes. And then you just feed them to the plant. Oh, no. But then you get to eat alien goo and get extra health. So it really pans out in the end. Win-win, really. <laughs> um, but again, that just leads to more of those moments where, you know, the I, I think you don't really need co-op to solve the puzzles and stuff so much. It's, it's just nice to have somebody there to say, did, did you see me do that? <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you want to help me feed the cute, adorable birds to the horrible vines? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, but the game is just, it's so incredibly charming. I, I kind of feel like it's one of those that is going to be horribly, horribly underrated. People are going to sleep on it because it's a small indie game and it's relatively short. And I hope that they don't because it's, if, you know how, like, everybody was like, oh, my God, No Man's Sky, you go around and you scan all these weird animals and stuff? Like, Journey to the Savage Planet takes that premise, but it actually works. Hmm. You know? Like, No Man's Sky didn't work when it came out. <laughs> Journey to the Savage Planet works. And and even though the there's there's a limited number of, of animals and plants that you can kind of interact with, what's there is so well thought out and so well created that you can't help but fall in love with it, even if it leaves you running and screaming because it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many times where I was like, do I want to fuck with that or is it going to hurt me? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> and, you know, you have to get close to things to scan them. So, Yeah. I'm gonna go fuck with it. <laughs> but that's that's too where the humor pulls in because the the AI assistant will be like, "Oh, it's okay if you die. We just created a clone of you <laughs> with all of your memories, and let's not think about it too much, okay?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny because they know it's such a weird, horrifying premise that you know. It just destroys you. and Like the teleporters, they destroy your body and create a clone of you wherever you're going. And like it's honest about it, but then it's just like, don't think about it, okay? Shh. <laughs> it looks <That's> awesome. Cool. <laughs> and I love that they were, they, they put that kind of attitude toward it because they could be all serious about, it. well, this is the proper cloning process. And like, no, they, they're goofy about it. And it's fun. It's, it makes the whole game enjoyable and fun. Yeah. Well, you have me almost sold on it. The only question left is 30 bucks. Is it worth it? Yeah, I think it is. I, I, I can see where some people would be like, 
it's a shorter campaign. It's only, I want to say, like, six hours or so. Um, but that's if you're just, like, whole hog going in on, on just trying to complete it and get the achievements. You're meant to go into this world and just explore and goof off with a friend. And I think that if that's what you're planning to do, you're going to definitely get your $30 worth out of it. Awesome. Yeah. I might have to pick this one up then. Do it. We'll go feed puffer birds to meat vortexes. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll let you feel guilty about it. Oh, I won't feel guilty at all. <laughs> I don't know. They have really big eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of big eyes, the next game to talk about is called Stone, developed and published by Convict Games, released January 27th on Xbox One for $14.99. Stone is a single-player, third-person interactive story where a hungover koala detective wakes up to find his lover Alex has been kidnapped. Walk, talk, drink, dance, smoke, watch, sauna, trip, and find Alex. Cole, tell us about Stone. You really just told the whole entirety of the game. All right, then 15 bucks. What do you think? <laughs> so, I, I think I need to tell, fill in a few gaps. Okay. But you, you gave us the gist of it, um, by and large. So the whole premise is that, yes, you play as a private investigator who is... Um, an alcohol, weed loving, smart ass, slacker koala. This game is made in Australia, in case this isn't becoming incredibly obvious. <laughs> 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 um, shoot, I'm trying to figure out a way to like word this without giving away any of the big twists. <laughs> so, first things first, Stone is meant to play. Like those old school private detective noir type 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 movies, I stumbled on that, um, and everything about it kind of plays into that storytelling vibe, even to the fact that the game only lasts about an hour and a half hour forty five minutes. It's incredibly linear. Um, you basically just go place to place. You can like interact with items in each area that you're in, but generally you're just going to go up to an NPC, start a dialogue cutscene. You can choose different dialogue options in some of the scenes, but they don't have any effect on the outcome of the game whatsoever. None. They don't change dialogue. You might get one line of dialogue different. It's just they're they're kind of arbitrarily there to give you the illusion of choice <laughs> um, because the game is very much meant for you to play through it in acts and experience it as the developers wanted it experienced, um, which is fine. It's just that it's an an odd thing. Like just make it a visual novel <laughs> at that point. <laughs> don't don't bother putting in two options when you're both going to get the same reaction. Yeah. But that's the thing they did there. Um, one of the best things about Stone is the atmosphere and the way that they use colors to set the, set the ambiance of the game. So to, to dive into that a little more, everything is is three dimensional. I don't want to use the phrase that it's low poly because it's not, but it, it has a low, uh, a low amount of textures. If that makes sense, it's kind of like everything has a chunky, minimal look to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but without being low poly, like it's it's clearly he's a koala, and and you know when you're in a room, you're in a room, but there's not going to be like super high definition detail on the couch or anything like that. Um, but what's more important is the way that they use lighting in these different areas that you can go to. Um, the apartment stone wakes up and finds that his apartment is just trashed and everything in the apartment is very dark and dimly lit and you can almost smell the smoke hanging in the air just from the way it looks. 
Or if right. You're, if you're at my house, you can smell the smoke <laughs> that's hanging in the air. <laughs> the, the funny thing about that is no matter where you're at as stone, it doesn't do anything for the game, doesn't change anything, doesn't give you any bonuses or anything. You can just press Y and he'll stop and smoke a cigarette yeah. until you press Y and stop him. Um, but, you know, the, yeah, c- the apartment. We'll go is, with cigarette. We'll- yeah. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> But um, the apartment is, is trashed and dimly lit, and it's just, it feels like a heavy room to be in when you're in those scenes. But then you'll go to the Smoky Possum, which is the, the small bar that, that Stone frequents. And the air, it's, it doesn't feel as heavy. It's got warmer lighting, and it's, you can see more of the, the room. It's all, you know, well lit, and there's art on the walls that you can check out. And it just feels like a more calming, relaxed, you know, small town bar atmosphere, right? Mm-hmm. But then you go to the techno club, and like there's strobe lights everywhere. And again, it's got that fake fog lingering in the air, and you, you can't see people very well, even though there are NPCs all over the place. And you had just from the way that it's lit, which is so hard to describe on a podcast, but like you, <laughs> you really just get the emotion in the atmosphere, atmosphere from the way that, that it looks. Um, it's one of the best aspects of the game, if you ask me. I would, I would nearly say it's worth playing just to, to see the way some of these areas are lit in the color grading and color scheme. Uh, of course, then again, I'm an art nerd and that kind of shit applies to me. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was just more like, Ooh, over everything. But you happen to be a music nerd and you would happen to like Joe that um, for every song in the game, it pops up a little box in the bottom of the corner and gives you the name and the song song's artist. Which is good. I love when games do that. Yeah. Like you, if you like a song that is playing, just go look that shit up. Just Google it. It's right there. It gave you everything. I don't think I've ever played a game before that's flat out been like, hey, this is a song. Go enjoy it. Um, so that was a neat little, a, a neat little thing for them to add in there. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> Which seems fitting on this game. It is. There's so much. <laughs> many weed jokes uh, <laughs> it's a vulgar game too like it this this is not a kid-friendly game no don't let the adorable koala <laughs> don't let the adorable koala confuse you um there are plenty of f-bombs there are a lot of of questionable jokes made and uh yeah i was i was very surprised um I knew I was expecting something with heavy weed references, but I didn't expect <laughs> the game to go where it went sometimes. So just be aware of what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> um, but then again, hey, it's, it's only going to take you an hour and a half to beat it. So if you get too over fussed by the, by the raunchiness, you can be like, whatever, I'm done with it anyway. <laughs> 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 well, then the last question is, is that hour and a half worth 15 bucks? I I think it is. I will say I was playing on a 1S and I, I had it on a solid state drive, but I did have some issues with framiness. So it could use a little bit of a, a little bit of polish. But I think that for $15, I absolutely enjoyed my time with it. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's like I said, because there's the whole... Um, you know, linear storytelling aspect to it. There's not a whole lot of reason to play it again once you've done it, except to go back and get a couple achievements. Thankfully, they've been very nice and included a scene selector. I don't just say chapter select. You can go back and choose the act and the scene. So you can go back and mop up the, whatever achievements you miss very quickly. Um, but that that does mean it is a, a one and done type of experience. I also wanted to point out one other thing that I lost my train of thought on earlier. You can take Stone to the movie theater. There's no reason to do it for the point of the game. Like the game never tells you to go to the movie theater. It's just something you have to do on your own. But I think you should because there are something I, I want to say there were a dozen full length 
Australian classic films wow. that you can watch at the movie theater. You just pick which one, and you can sit and put your controller down and watch the whole movie in the game. That's cool. So that is a nice little side note to have in there. If you are into, um, you know, classic international films, you could pick it up just for that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Well, next game to talk about is called Iconoclast, developed by Joakim Sandberg, published by Bifrost Entertainment, released July or uh, yeah, July. <laughs> well, <laughs> January 23rd. You could tell what month I wish it was uh, released mm-hmm. January 23rd on Xbox One for 1999. During Renegade Mechanic, Robin and uncover the secrets of a dying planet. Explore a big world filled with intricate puzzles, interesting characters, and menacing bosses in a beautiful platform adventure that tells a personal story about faith, purpose, and the challenge of helping people. Cole, tell us about Iconoclasts. Before I get started, i got to ask you one question. Have you played it? Yes. Were you aware that this entire game was created by one person? Yes. From the pixel art? To all the level crafting, to all the music, to all the cinematic trailers, one dude did it all. Pretty goddamn crazy. <laughs> and it is gorgeous. Here we go. I told you it was a good week. <laughs> Everything is so fucking pretty. And that says a lot because I am really hard on pixel art games. <laughs> I've I've been harsh on it. I think it's... A lot of times people will use pixel art and just kind of hastily, like, no details, but they're like, oh, it's 16-bit retro inspired. And they don't put any kind of effort into it. There's, you know, shortage of color or or world building. Not with Iconoclast. The world, the story, all of it just comes together so well. Um I'm on a podcast. I can't show it to you. (laughs) (laughs) You need to go and look at this game. Watch a trailer. Watch all of the trailers. (laughs) And then just go buy it because it's so well done. Um, Usually, look, I'm going to be incredibly honest. (laughs) Usually when we get games that are made by one person, you will see where that one person had one very good skill (laughs) set. And then you can tell where they were kind of just learning as they went with the other areas. If you had told me that one person had made Iconoclast, I would have been like, oh, and and I hadn't played the game. I had just seen the screens. I'd been like, oh, that person was really good at pixel art. But the game probably doesn't play that well. (laughs) Or the levels are horrible or something. There would have been something to throw me off, right? Yeah. Not. But there's not. There's not. Literally, from the way that the puzzles are designed to making you think of how you're going to get from level to level, um, scene to scene, however you want to describe it, from, from puzzle design to the music to the art, to even how well Robin moves in her world is so well thought out. So then you think, okay, it's got good programming. When you jump, you jump. When you shoot, you shoot. I don't have anything to bitch about there. It <laughs> looks pretty. I don't got anything to bitch about there. The music's solid. I don't got anything to bitch about. So then that leaves the narrative, right? So this is where he's got to fuck it up. But he doesn't. Iconoclast has this insanely rich story. You play as a rogue mechanic. Now, I hear you. How can a mechanic be rogue? (laughs) They fix shit. That's all they do. No, trust me. Robin lives in a world where everything is ordained and, and, and micromanaged. And so you can't go outside of your assignments. And she has not been assigned to be a mechanic, but her father was a mechanic and she wants to follow in her father's footsteps. And so she has her father's wrench and she goes around the law and helps people who can't afford to have the government come in and, and repair their home or, or, um, 
whatever the situation may call for that needs a mechanic. Try not to give out a spoiler. <laughs> um, whatever situation it calls for that needs a mechanic, she will be there even if she's not supposed to be. There's so much lore, and it's so ingrained deep in in every character that you meet. They're so fleshed out and, and well thought about and presented in such a way that you you genuinely attach to them. Where normally I'd be like, okay, well, that's an NPC. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see good things happen to every character I came across. <laughs> Which um, is hard to do in a game. It is. Yeah. I was I was very impressed with literally all of it. I will say um, that even on its easiest difficulty, thank goodness for that, by the way. <laughs> um, there's a relaxed difficulty just so you can explore and, and enjoy the story and not have to worry about getting your ass beat too much. Thanks for that. That's perfect for eternal mode. Um <laughs> I, I think I died like twice and it was because I was really fucking dumb. <laughs> um, but even even on the easier difficulties, the puzzles are not particularly easy. You really have to think about your situation and your surroundings and how you're going to move around. But that movement is one of the best things about the game. You can use Robin's wrench to fling yourself around the world <laughs> what the fuck why is that so enjoyable <laughs> there there are some of the um movement uh there's bolts like around the world and i can't figure out how to get to them to save myself right now and i'm so annoyed but then I just keep coming back to them and trying to do it over and over until it, because <laughs> it's so satisfactory once you actually pull it off. Once yeah. you get to the point where you learn how to like make the big swings and leaps, then you're just like, oh, I am Tarzan <laughs> <laughs> with a wrench <laughs> because it's so fluid and it just moves so well. Um, there are upgrades that you can craft. I think the crafting in Iconoclast is probably the weakest segment of the game. Um, which which is totally I don't mind because I don't care about crafting in games. Yeah, it was, I, it was one of those, you can craft upgrades, but you can absolutely play the game and not give a fuck about any upgrades. I don't want to admit how far I was before I remembered I had made things I could, could equip. <laughs> Because I was just shitting and getting it through the game and having a good time doing so. So you can you can craft things that will let you have a little more damage on your wrench. Because you can't hit shit with it, which is brilliant. <laughs> um, or it'll spin a little longer because you can you need it to spin to activate some gears. Um or you can breathe a little longer underwater. Again, I I mostly played on relax mode. I tried out some of the harder difficulties. I was like, yeah, not for me. <laughs> um, so I, I never was in a position where I was going to drown playing around under the water anyway. Yeah. So again, it was just like, I didn't need it, but it's there. And if I remember it, I'll equip it. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I'm fine. <laughs> um... But it, it is just so much fun to to just jump and leap your way around in, in this platformer. Uh, there are boss battles. I think most of the boss battles are, are pretty interesting. There are a few that just kind of fall back to old school platformer tropes. Um, I'm trying not to give away a spoiler. But there is there is one where basically like you just have to parry everything back, and I I spent so much time like trying to hit a weak spot or thinking I was supposed to do this or do that, and then I realized I was just supposed to parry, and I was <laughs> like, well that's no fun. <laughs> that's literally every platformer ever. Let me do something interesting with the cool tools that I have. Um, I wanted to try, I kept trying to throw a bomb into a, a propeller, for example, just to see what would happen and it would just fall back down and not do anything. And I was like, so let down. 
<laughs> it was like all this time all I had to do was parry and I could have done something cool like threw the bomb in the window or something. So that's that was probably one of the weakest moments of the game and that's that's pretty mundane if that's the worst you've got for weakness, you know? Yeah. Um so beyond that though, I I can't believe it was made by one person. Yeah, it's really impressive for just a single person mm-hmm. experience. It's just it's so well made. It's so enjoyable. Uh, it's so addictive. Like I, I found myself. Oh, one more save point. One more save point. Yeah. Uh, one more save point. Yeah. When I was playing, David was like, "Oh, can I have the Xbox?" Because I was like, "Yeah, sure. Let no! me go find it." Well, I was like, "Yeah, sure. Let me go find a safe place." And then, like two hours later, he's like, "So, did you find a safe yet?" <laughs> I was like, "Uh, no. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll find one." He never got the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> he gave up and went to bed because he's smart. <laughs> nice. Well, overall, like, twenty bucks on Icono Class. What do you think of it? I I give it a buy. This is probably one of the best two D platformers I've played in a while. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I agree. It's a lot of fun, and it's again one person mm-hmm. that is impressive. Yeah, I, I read it took like seven years to develop, and I, Damn. I'm i surprised it only took seven years. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, next game to talk about is called It Came From Space and Ate Our Brains, developed by Triangle Studios, published by All In Games, released January 28th on Xbox One, Switch, PS4, and PC for $14.99. Pair up with a friend or three friends if you have that many and keep blasting aliens into space until your score can't get any higher. And then die like the biggest badass ever in this action packed arcade shooter. Cole, tell us about it came from space and ate our brains. So, um, an army of neon pink voxel art aliens have invaded and it's now up to you to survive the onslaught. And all of its isometric twin stick glory. <laughs> um, you have up to four local players. Unfortunately, there is no online. I would give anything to have online in this game. Oh, I know. It would have been so much fun to just like cram a couple of buddies from where the fuck ever in here and yelled at each other over the headsets about the aliens and been like, watch this. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen. Um, but you can play locally. And my kids, I was like, here, take this controller and watch this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can have you and up to three of your nearest and dearest friends gather. I don't know how people play these on like computer screens when they're all like close local multiplayer. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Play that shit on TV. Um, I just had a random thought. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Um, you're going to work your way through six different levels in the campaign mode. Um, you'll have rooftops. You know, there's a, a hospital clinic. There's even grungy green sewers. Everything is dark as fuck. <laughs> you are a little voxel art dude. You have a flashlight. You have your gun. And everything is damn near pitch black. Um, that means that what you can see is very, very minimal in design. Minimal, I, I, I don't know why, but minimal was clearly the, the thing that stuck in my head the most about it. it came from outer space and ate our brains. Like, there's, where there's detail, it's important detail. And then everything else just kind of falls to the wayside. So your environments are just plain gray walls that are darkened out by the vignette of night and there's there's not any you know colors or details besides the occasional neon sign the aliens themselves are literally little neon pink voxel art that's that's it Uh, they're little square dudes (laughs) some crawl some look like these and will sidestep you most of them, there, oh, there is the occasional like great big giant motherfucker that'll come chase you and be a bullet sponge. <laughs> Their eyes glow, and that's the long and short of it. They don't shoot at you. They don't have any differences besides the one that will sidestep you. None of them speed up if you if they hit you or or, or if you hit them. They're just there, um, which is fine. 
the their greatest their greatest accomplishment is like surrounding you as a horde, and that's when you're fucked. Um, but beyond that, they're just they're just kind of bland targets for you to hit. Um, it's, it's kind not, of a, it's not like this game does anything really special. It just does what it does well. Yeah, that's that's really it. Like I feel like the things I'm gonna say are gonna sound harsh, and it's not meant to come across as harsh as it's going to, because the game plays great. Um, and I had a lot of fun with it. It is it is a t- t- you know top down isometric twin stick, whichever one you prefer to refer to it as. And it, you know it aims well. I would complain that there is no sensitivity. So I couldn't up my sensitivity and I felt like I was taking forever to get anywhere or do anything. Um, that would probably be my number one complaint. Um, I, I thought it was kind of adorable how like there was a left for dead element to it and that you're trying to get to the safe houses. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest reasons that I was complaining about how everything is very bland as far as the scenery goes is because it makes it difficult to know which way you need to go to get to the safe houses. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room for the paths that you can take, but ultimately there will only be like one actual exit to the safe houses. And if you get turned around, you would never know it. Yeah. I have found myself all the way back at the beginning by a closed up safe house door and be like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I've got to go back. <laughs> just because there's no, even just like the tiniest little arrow indicator somewhere to point where the safe house is to help you get there would have been a big help. Yeah. Um, one other thing is that there's the safe houses themselves are kind of bland. You don't gain any health by getting there. You don't have to worry about ammo, so that's not an issue. But um, you don't get any health. You There's nothing, like no power-ups you can buy or anything like that. There are power-ups. They're often hidden. Um, you'll find boxes that glow pink or uh, filing cabinets, things like that. Something in the world will glow pink. You can shoot it. You might get a power-up out of it. You won't get one every time, but you might. Um, it was a pretty, pretty high number for power up drops, but this leads to minimal issue number two. And that is that the power ups are color coded, but you have no way of knowing what you're picking up until you have it. So yellow ones are always credits. Green ones and blue ones are your actual power ups. Now they could be a turret. They could be a shield. They could be laser beams that surround you. They could be a med kit. There's no way to drop one. If you already have it, you just have to use it if you're going to pick up another one. Yeah. Um, so there's no way to drop it. There's no way to know what it's going to be. There's no way to swap it out. You might use a med kit so that you can grab a power up hoping that it's a shield or lasers and it just be another med kit. <laughs> or you could have a shield and, you know, need a med kit and end up with a turret. Um, the other thing is, once you get through the entirety of a level, you get to the end, and your big boss battle for the end of every level is just a big egg. Now, while you're chipping away at that egg, you get constantly swarmed by enemies. So at least that's something. <laughs> there's there's some element to it. But again, all the enemies just lurch towards you. None of them do anything special. So... If you've picked up like a rocket launcher, you're just blasting through them and you're going to be done. And that's that. Um, the number of enemies is severely increased <laughs> at higher difficulties. So, so that does become more of a problem. And that is where you're going to need friends to help you out. Um, but all the fusses aside, some reason, some way, somehow, I found myself just happily trudging through this game not giving a <laughs> fuck at all and I'm like these pink motherfuckers need to die and I just kept going I wish I moved a little faster yeah because I, I, I get it I know why the slow walking speed is a thing it's increased tension clearly if the aliens have come and taken over shit you're not going to be running down alleyways and sewers it's fine I get it but in a video game Nobody likes to go slow. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Especially not me. <laughs> um, you can run for a few minutes, not even a few minutes, a few seconds, and then your stamina runs out and you've got to like trudge along slowly until it builds back up. Um, so I, I just wish that I had increased sensitivity and higher speed, movement speed, and online. And then this would be like a perfect shooter. <laughs> It'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, the lack of online, I think, is the real the real bummer for me. The rest of this stuff I could kind of just ignore and get around because it's a fun game. But, man, I wish this had online. Yeah, it's just one of those not everybody has people to sit on their couch kind of situations. Like me. And I, I know that there's, you know, there's a whole slew of people who only want local multiplayer and oh, online gaming is what's what's ruined gaming and I know it. I know there's people who feel that way. But I play online games because I can't get out and hang out with people. <laughs> it's not safe. I can get germs and get sick and then I'm in the hospital for a week. I ain't got time for that. <laughs> so I like to play games online so I don't have to risk catching other people's contagions. So <laughs> let I me just kill. don't have friends. You just which is <laughs> You know, its own issue. <laughs> probably a greater, pre- probably a greater number of people in the world have that as their issue than people who are concerned about contagions like me. Yeah. But I am concerned about contagions. I ain't trying to get the coronavirus out here. Okay. Oh Thanks. lord. <laughs> we couldn't go the whole show and not mention the coronavirus. <laughs> it's how we're going to become popular. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What well, you're going to contract it. I hope not. <laughs> you shut your whore mouth. <laughs> Buy the game. Next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, next game to talk about is called Hyper Dot, developed by Tribe Games, published by Glitch, released January 31st on Xbox One PC for $19.99. Hyper Dot is a minimal action arcade masterpiece with one rule, dodge everything, evade enemies, and test your skills in over 100 trials in the campaign mode. Outlast your friends in multiplayer battles or build custom challenges with the level editor. Cole, tell us about HyperDot. So, I, I, this is the most minimalist game. I know I just kept saying that a whole lot about, uh, about it came from space and hair brains. HyperDot takes the minimalist thing and cranks it to 125. <laughs> <laughs> because 10 just was not 11 is not an 125 you got a circle you can move a circle inside that circle that's the game now as the game gets a little more unruly other geometric shapes will be thrown in from the edges of the circle and you need to avoid them that's it that's all of hyper dot I, okay. I should you not it is literally a hundred levels of how many different ways can we throw shapes at you and you miss it. Huh. And yet, for some reason, I kept saying, one more level. <laughs> well, that's we the mark of a good game. Time. Yeah, it is. And it's such a simple concept and a simple game. And yet, at the same time, I was like, oh, I'm going to beat this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I am in here. So many of the different mutators they put in is what keeps it interesting, though. As I said, there's there's geometric shapes that will come in. But they ha- each have their own um, attack. doesn't seem like an appropriate word. But they, they have their own ability. So, like, um, the, the pentagons will just kind of move across, right? And they'll move in whatever, in a line of whatever they come across. Or some of the longer, longer lines will just like Morse code their way across, <laughs> across the circle. But then there are those fucking pink triangles. These are the bane of my existence. <laughs> Do you want to know why, Joe? Why? Because they're homing missiles. Oh. And they will chase your little purple ass. All over that circle. <laughs> now, there are certain ways to get past each level. And while the basis is just don't touch anything because then you automatically die, the reality is that the game compounds on that by adding in certain mutators like, okay, just survive. You, you, you have survival ones where it's like, don't get hit by anything for 10 seconds. 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Can you make it a whole minute? 
Good for you. Next, here's the pink missiles. Don't die. Then it says, oh, well, we survived the pink missiles. Clearly think you're good at this game. Now everything is black and you can't see where things are coming at you from. <laughs> you have just a little bit of orb of light around your little purple dot. Don't get dead. Do you survive that? Good. Now do that. But collect these tokens. And we'll let you out when you collect four tokens. Oh, man. Oh, you got four? Well, here's six. Do it again. <laughs> oh, you want the lights on? Sure. But now everything is going to move in this crazy ass pattern and you're literally only going to have a tiny, tiny little area that you have to rotate in a circle in and hope you don't get hit by a fucking pink homing rocket. Before you know it, this, hey, you're a dot inside a circle, live becomes... Hey, you're a dot inside a circle and everything is fucking trying to kill you. And good luck in that <laughs> tiny little corner and hope that nothing spawns over there. But it will. But it will. But if you're lucky, maybe a pop-up will spawn and you can get it instead. Because there are occasionally power-ups in some of the levels. So you can get a shield. You can stack those shields. You could have 15 shields as long as you ain't an idiot and fucking die into the pink homing missiles, which you will. You could get the little bomb. And it's going to blow shit up so that you have an, an, a little more wiggle room and you can move around some more without hitting something. You might even hit a timer and that slows shit down. And as much as it sounds like the bomb is the best thing or the shield, it's the clock that you will learn to love. It becomes the best power up because then you have a few seconds to actually see where shit is moving to. <laughs> because holy fuck, those little geometric shapes move really fucking fast. Now, I started off playing the game on Xbox. And I thought, well, duh, I'm an Xbox reviewer. I'm going to play this on Xbox. Then, I was poking around on Windows 10. And I realized it was a Play Anywhere title. Mm -hmm. And so, I couldn't help myself. And I had to say... I wonder if this is easier to play with a mouse. Yes. <laughs> Jesus H. Christ. Yes, it is. <laughs> now, there are two sides to this coin. Your progress from the Xbox to the PC or the PC to the Xbox does not carry over. So you will have to beat the levels again if you beat them on one and not the other. That said... That's weird that it doesn't carry over. The whole point of Play Anywhere your, is that your progress is carries your over. Your achievement progress carries over. So, there's an achievement for beating 50 levels, correct? Mm -hmm. If you did 25 of them on the Xbox and you got stuck like a bitch, you could load up the PC version, play it on there, and get to that same 25th level that fucked you over, but you'd still get the achievement. Interesting. So it was kind of an odd quirk, but it was one that I was not at all mad about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I will ever get to those 100th levels, although I will say it is far easier to do with a mouse. Um, in addition to that, you can make your own levels. There are a lot of mutators and options that you can put into to create some weird ass levels <laughs> that will make everybody hate you. Or you could be like super nice and like crank up the power ups to high and make it really easy. <laughs> <laughs> I made a hard one because if I suffered, everybody else has to as well. Oh God. <laughs> <coughs> I bet you didn't think I'd have so much to say about a game where you're a dot inside a circle, huh? Yeah, I, did. I really didn't know how much there would be to say about this one, but at 20 bucks, what do you think of it? I. On the premise alone, I would be like, wow, that's a high price. <laughs> but given how much thought has gone into creating these levels, how many different levels there are, how many different mutators, the fact that you can actually make your own levels, I'd say it's worth it. I'd, I'd give it a buy it, yeah. All right. Well, next game to talk about is called Coffee Talk, developed by Togue Productions, published by Course Worldwide Games. 
Released January 30th on Xbox One and PS4 for $13.99. Coffee Talk is a coffee brewing and heart-to-heart talking simulator about listening to fantasy-inspired modern people's problems and helping them by servicing up a warm drink or two. Cole, what is Coffee Talk? Remember how I said it was a good week? Yeah. Coffee Talk was a good week. <laughs> uh, and I, I want to point something out. I just gushed over how pretty Iconoclast was, right? And I was like, boy, everybody's going to be so surprised to hear me talk about a pretty pixel art game. But that's what I thought about Coffee Talk, because I hadn't played Iconoclast yet. So I have two pixel art games in one week, and I thought they were both fucking gorgeous. Wow. I may have turned over a new leaf. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what this side of me is. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I and and where is the pixel art hater that I was? Uh, <laughs> but Coffee Talk is so pretty. It's so well illustrated. All of the characters just ah, they're all so eye catching. I love the look of the the cutscenes. Um so before I get into talking about the cutscene, so the premise is you own a coffee shop. Ta da! Here's your coffee shop. You're a barista. Ta da! Uh, you don't ever get to see yourself, but I'm going to assume you've got a pretty little apron and all that. <laughs> <laughs> People will come into your coffee shop. Your, your first and most loyal customer ever is Freya, and she is a struggling writer and. She comes into the coffee shop and she decides that she's going to start writing the stories of the people who come into the coffee shop, right? Okay. So other people will come into the coffee shop each day. You'll have a series of regulars. Um, and their, their dramas, their love stories, their action stories, all these things about these people's lives will play out in front of you. And it's all wrapped up around the premise of you serving them coffee while th- learning their stories. Um, so it's, it's, <laughs> let, look, this is a visual novel with a coffee making mini game. Okay. <laughs> Let's be perfectly honest here. I hope you like to read because you are going to be reading a lot and do not just think that you're going to like hold down the button and skip past everything. Because you need to pay attention because little elements of what they want for their order is tucked away inside of their stories. Mm. Um, for instance, I'm going to strip any of the spoiler stuff, but there is one character who always asks for espresso. They're always trying to stay awake. And one day in the game they will come into the coffee shop and they will very clearly look exhausted and your conversation with them is very much so that they they need to rest or they're going to hurt themselves correct yeah so you, then you have a choice you know that they're in a bad position and that they need sleep but they're telling you they want their normal espresso do you give them the coffee and keep them awake, or do you make them something that'll help them sleep? Uh. That is one of the few times the game will let you get away <laughs> with making something different than what the customer wants. <laughs> um, although I will say it's 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 not meant to be punishing. Like the customers are never gonna lose their shit at you if you fuck up their order. It's meant to be. A relaxing game where you learn the stories, you develop an interest in the characters, you learn their outcomes, and you might learn a little something about yourself along the way. That sounded so cheesy. (laughs) You might learn something about yourself along the way. I can't give away a spoiler, but it's the best part of the game. (laughs) Okay? I'll tell you after we record if you want to know. Okay. But, but there is uh, a good reason for that line, and it is not what it seems. Okay, well, as it stands, 14 bucks on Coffee Talk, what do you think about it? Please buy this game. I know that it's a hard pitch to say, hey, it's a pretty pixel art game, and there's a lot of reading. <laughs> but it goes 
off the listen okay your customers are vampires and werewolves and uh shapeshifters all right and you're giving them coffee and tea and it's just all wrapped up as like this is normal now it's apparently supposed to be seattle 2020 I don't know what year this was originally developed, but if we don't get to September <laughs> in 2020 and Seattle is in influx with orcs and vampires who create video <laughs> games, then I'm going to be so disappointed. I think I have okay. some bad news for you. <laughs> Fuck. Don't break my heart here, Joe. <laughs> but please buy the game. Okay. I will. Okay. And I'm going to spoil it for you after the show anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, don't spoil it now because we got one last game to talk about. That is called Milo's Quest, developed by Light Up, published by our friends at Rattalake Games. Released January 28th on PS4 and Vita, 29th on Xbox One, 31st on the Switch for $4.99. The young pupper Milo is enjoying his time in the park and sees a delicious bone to chew on. The bone is cursed and sets free the evil King Old Skull. Now it's up to Milo to go on an adventure to stop the curse. Cole, what happens on Milo's quest? That just sounds so dark for the adorable <laughs> little game that you play. <laughs> Like, I know I've seen the, the title card and, like, there was a big green ghost and I was like, I don't know why. The game is so fucking adorable. <laughs> my cat just pulled something off my desk. Um, but Stop. Thank you. Get into a fist fight with your cat on the show. Fight. Me, Come son of a bro. bitch. Mm. Mm, <laughs> motherfucker. He's been so well behaved this whole time, he can't stand himself anymore. <laughs> you want to fucking go? You want to fucking has, go? <laughs> he has to break something now. <laughs> so, you play it. <sighs> really? <laughs> you, you done stepping on shit? You good? Yes, right, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, are you done stepping on shit? Right. Yes. So you play as the super adorable little dog, Milo. <laughs> and he is on a quest... Of some sort. Look, it's a rattle lake again. Okay. <laughs> we don't dive too much into it. I got a question. I meant to look it up. I think this may have been the same developer behind a uh, Super Box Land Demake. I'll have to look it up while you're talking. You played that one, right? Yeah. The box puzzles are identical. The art is very similar. Um, I I am like nine hundred and twenty three percent sure it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> the same developer <laughs> behind this one. Oh, apparently it's from a solo artist. Okay. I'm not trying to pronounce that name though. But it, it does seem like it's a, a, a one man show type thing. Of course. Yes, yeah, super Rattler, super so. boxland D make and super Wilo D make. And now I Milo's knew quest. it. I, I didn't play Super Wilo D make. So yeah, I knew it was a very similar style. Um because there are there are puzzles in Milo's quest. Where you have to like push around the boxes and put them on buttons, and it's the exact same way that you pushed around things in um, in Super Box Land. So I I figured it had to at least be a similar group. Um, it's a very easy game to play. Of course it is. It's a Rattalaika. <laughs> um, super adorable. Milo's Quest is one of those games that I as I was playing it, like the whole time I kept thinking. This is a great beginner game for kids. Yeah. Like this is how you introduce a game, an adventure game to toddlers. Um, I would very happily hand Milo's Quest to a, a three or four year old and be like, good luck because they could handle it. <laughs> and I especially love the fact that if you want, you can turn off the puzzles if you want to focus on yeah. a more action oriented game or you could turn off the combat if you want to focus on a more puzzle oriented game. Yeah, I love that that was an option. So you ultimately end up with three options. You can have the puzzles and the combat, just the combat or just the puzzles. Um, so again, you can make it as easy or as difficult, as complicated or, or mindless as you wanted. Um, so it, it was... I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so proud of you. We're at the end oh, here. We're at the end. I know it. I'm. It's There's a light at the tunnel, but I think it's attached to a train that's going to hit me. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So it's a it's a very simple concept. There are bones in the bushes. You can collect the bones, use those to buy upgrades. You don't need them. You can totally get through the game without them. But hey, for, if a little kid is playing it, they're going to get tickled seeing the, the bones rack up. You need to complete the puzzles to drop gates so that you can get keys, which drop other gates, which let you eventually get to the bosses, who, if you wait a few seconds, let their guards down, and you can just run and charge into them. There are artifacts that, around the map that you need to pick up. For example, you need to get a glove that lets you push the boxes around. Um, you can get binoculars to let you look around the map. There's, um, shoot, it's a helmet. A helmet lets you charge um, so that you can hit the ghosts. I don't know why you need a helmet to hit a ghost, but whatever. Here we are. Uh, to protect um, your noggin. But they're ghosts. You, you're probably just going to walk right through it. <laughs> You need a shotgun full of rock salt. Haven't you ever watched Supernatural? <laughs> Give Milo a shotgun full of rock salt. Um, anyway, he doesn't have one, so here we are. He has a helmet. That lets him crush, uh, run and crunch into the ghosts and get rid of them. Um, very easy to play. If you do mess up on a puzzle, go back and come into it again, and it'll have reset. You can try again. Um, but if you really just look at most of them for a few seconds, you're going to figure them out. Like I said, though, you can turn them off. If you're letting a little kid play and they're getting stressed by the puzzles, just turn them off. We'll let them go through and kill the ghosts and they'll be fine. Um, simple, adorable little game. Quick completion. If you're an adult, great for little kids that maybe haven't played adventure games that you want to introduce to them. I think it's probably the best the like best audience for Milo's quest. Um, but I'd be more than happy to like hand it to my kids and say, have fun. Yeah. So five bucks on it. Your verdict. It's only five bucks. Easy completion in that regard. Yeah. F you know, fuck it. Why not? But as far as actually like playing it and enjoying it, and it goes, I, I do think it's more geared towards kids and more suitable for kids than adults, unless you're trying to get the achievements. <laughs> um, so then, but in that regard, I would still say it's a buy it. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's another quick, easy completion. And uh, hopefully they work on a Milo's quest too, because I would play more. It's so stinking adorable. It is. It's so cute. You know what else is cute? What? Grant. Grant is, <laughs> I'm assuming, quite an adorable egg. He is an adorable one. So thanks again to him for coming on, chatting with us today. Yeah. Uh, thanks to you for being here and doing all that you do. And th thanks to me for editing three days worth of work together into one episode. <laughs> you, you too are a good egg.